why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why must my heart feel lonely? And long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He, His eye is on the
On Jesus, the rock I stand when I need shelter. When I need a friend, I go to the rock. When I need shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Good. Everybody, take your seats and get comfortable. I want to say greetings to all everybody that's in here and everybody that's out there from the Children of the Free Church Ministry. My name is Charles Garcia. I'm the teaching pastor. And as I usually say, I'll say again, besides catching us here live on Sunday evenings, you can also watch the archives and reruns on YouTube and on Facebook. And at some point in time, you may be able to get them on Ustream as well, where we have quite a few messages where we started out. I want to start off by reading two messages. I wasn't going to do this, but I, I'll do it tonight just to kind of give you an idea of the things that come in. This one's hard to miss, as you notice. I hope it doesn't throw the cameras off with the color here. But this one comes from Nevada and it says with all the crazy stuff that's going on all over the world lately floods tornadoes fires mudslides too much rain not enough rain and on and on it can be scary to think about I know we are in the end times but my faith falters not because of your teaching thank you so much for instilling in me my faith to hear God's words and to know how to see his works. That. Second one, this one comes from the desert out in California. It says, it was a delight being able to finally get to hear and see all of you. And she doesn't mean all of me, she means all of us. See, all of you. For two weeks I haven't been able to, and it might as well have been two years. But I never lost faith and just kept up my determination, and tonight it paid off. Uh, part of the reason behind this is because we're going through different equipment and servers and different ways of doing things, and there's been some glitches along the way here. But she says that, and then says, take care, you guys. I know winter is closing in. Be safe and well. You're ever in my thoughts and prayers. Thank you for all your teaching. It has made a great impact on my life. I'm so proud of you and what you do. God bless you a thousand times over. You hear that? Okay. Last week, part of the message, we had a long introduction last week and then a rifle shot message. Part of the message was a combination on putting God first and on giving particularly regarding the building of God's church, specifically our ministry is what we were focusing on, so that we can get God's true word out there to those that are his. And I want to have you all recall and remember recent teaching where we showed you that God opened a great and effectual door unto us, but there be many adversaries. Remember that? Well, along with that, I want to say and what we're doing here, to you out there and you in here, but particularly you out there, you shouldn't just be sitting out there listening and learning, but participate. Remember, this is an interactive classroom on eternity. I teach, you learn, and you're supposed to come prepared. You're supposed to have your Bible. For the most part, we use the... King James Version. But you're supposed to have your Bible, a tablet, pens and pencils, post-its, highlighters. The way we're set up here and properly under God, you pay your tuition for school after you're taught, as opposed to every other university out there where you pay before you set your foot in the door. Here you pay after you're taught. You support you hold up my arms in the battles that we're in. 
give, like I was saying, you get your messages to me. I just showed you a couple of examples. And then you be faithful to be at church every week, no matter what. Now, once you've made that commitment, those that have done that know this. If you don't know this, open your eyes and see it. And if you haven't made that yet, realize that once you make that commitment to be here every week, I want you to notice that all the barbecues and all the graduations and all the social events and obligations are coincidentally all going to start happening on Sundays and on Sunday evening. Anybody notice that? I say to that, nothing, and I repeat, nothing should be more important than being faithful to God. Now, your message is in response to the teaching and giving God's way, in addition to all that that I've just said, are all designed and intended to support the teaching getting out there. And yes, you can bring others in as and if God presents the opportunities. The reason I'm hesitating on that is because we're not interested in having looky-loos here or rubberneckers or people that are just checking out of curiosity. Just those that are serious about God's business. We highlighted in the teaching before last week in building God's church and God moving us up <coughs> to further invade the territory of the prince of the power of the air, which is what we're doing. You know, you've been taught and recently, and you know the opposition and the attacks against us for this. Tonight, we're going to learn about how these attacks can come from close by, nearby, and indeed sometimes even from within us. Now you know how you can dream of something or aspire to do something in your personal life, your private life, and as we're doing it applies to what we're doing here, building this ministry to put out God's truth to do something, along come the naysayers. And they tell you how you can't do that. Or you could never do that. Or why are you doing that? You, you know what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying. Yes, even that one that's sitting on your shoulder saying to you, yeah, right. You don't have what it takes, the cost, the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know the situation that I'm talking about with the naysayers and what you do to yourself under those circumstances. But what we're talking about is even more serious than that when you realize what's behind the issues that I'm talking about now. God rises up to do something. Satan rises up to oppose. Now we've had discussions here in the family and within the staff about being positive and avoiding the negative in your life and your spiritual life because of this simple fact. Positivity equals faith. And negativity equals disfaith, what we call apistis, in your life. And that goes from health issues to finances across the board. Beware what you think and beware of what you speak forth, lest it become a self-fulfilling prophecy. You feel like you're poor, you speak forth poverty, and you're likely to become that. 
and the opposite is true. Now repeat, we're moving up. Building our ministry and church. And we're going to go to Nehemiah tonight to see what he did and went through. And God's entering in to his situation and the naysayers of his day and the opposition and how faith and diligence brought to pass the rebuilding of the wall, walls of God's city, Jerusalem. I'm going to want you to go there to the book of Nehemiah and set, set, set the stage historically of what's going on then and when this was. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. And that was an important official position. Nehemiah was tough. He was amongst a handful of the toughest in Scripture. And I want to start out by giving you an example of that. No nonsense attitude that he had. Are you in the book of Nehemiah yet? Let me join you there. Because we're actually going to go to the back of the book first to show you what I'm talking about here and then leap up to the front of it. I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Remember what I told you. He was tough. Tough customer. I want you to try and picture a modern day TV preacher. Hair all coiffed. Well, I can't do that. But uh, hair all coiffed saying to such things and I can't do this like my mentor Dr. Gene Scott but having them say things like God <laughs> and Jesus love you. Nehemiah saying let me find it for you. Nehemiah saying, I contended with the nobles of Judah. Here's a man of God. Not God and Jesus love you. He contended with the nobles. That's in verse 17 of chapter, thir chapter 13. Now go to verse 25 lest you didn't hear that right. And I contended with them. Can't you hear? I contended with them and cursed them. That means he cussed them out. Can't you hear the CNN headlines? Preacher cusses out his congregation. I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God. <laughs> now, it really means, I'm sure if they plucked out your hair, you'd swear by God. But he means swear by God. They, w they wouldn't do what, he, what they did that got him mad. And this is a man of God. You can picture <laughs> CNN entering in here. Preacher knocks the shillelagh out of his congregants. Yeah. You know. Enough said. Go to Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu. Chislu, for purposes, because there's an important point here, of our examination tonight would be December. Really, it's November, December. It's a little overlap there, but let's say December. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. By the way, the book of Nehemiah is a memoir written by Nehemiah. And he was here in about 500 B.C. So 500 years before Christ. 
Jerusalem had been destroyed by Babylon in 586 BC and the people were exiled to captivity. 70 years and Jerusalem was still in ruins. Now this is considered God's city and the temple was in there. A lot of people mistakenly think that Nehemiah rebuilt the temple. He actually rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem that contained the temple. This is important because in those days that was your only real defense was to have a wall around your city. Indeed, they had walls around cities. For example, in Babylon, the city was, the wall was something like 350 or 380 feet thick and 100 feet tall. You can picture that in your mind. So the walls were important in those days. It's back to the beginning. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, came to pass the month of Chislu, December, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came and certain men of Judah. Now these are the ones that are in exile. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So we asked after those people and God's city, the survivors of the exile. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. That's the 70 years later. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now I want you to notice unless you really study or have it pointed out to you, you pass over things like this. He mourned certain days. Well, that sounds reasonable. He cared about the city. But you're going to find out in a few paragraphs here that's four months that he mourned. Certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God. And when I say terrible, they don't mean he's awful. They mean awesome. That's really a better translation. The great and awesome God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Now, unless you be led astray by some of these Old Testament passages, when they talk about God's commandments and obeying his law, we know that Christ died and lifted that up off of us. So to us, to apply these teachings to us, we apply acting in faith and trusting God to obeying his commandments in these old passages. Sixth verse, still praying, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children beginning the seventh verse, we have dealt very corruptly. They acted wickedly. If you want to jot that in somewhere, that's what it means. We dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept thy commandments to us, acting in faith, trusting you. Nor the statutes, nor the judgments, same thing, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I'll scatter you abroad, abroad among the nations. They're living it. They were in exile to the Babylonians <coughs> because of the Babylonians. Ninth verse, but if you, turn un, if you turn unto me and keep my commandments to us, act in faith and trust him and do them though they were of you, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I've chosen to set my name there. That was, that's God's promise. And in this sense, his holy city, or your church, our church, is what he's talking about. Continues to pray to God, praising him. And he says in here a little blurb towards the end, I pray thee thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. 
Second verse, it came to pass in the month of Nisan. That's not the car you drive. Nisan is April, really March, April. But for our purposes, we're saying he wept certain days, he mourned certain days, remember? December to April. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of Artaxerxes king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine. He's the cupbearer. And gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. Got to be careful how you act around the king, because, well, because, you'll see. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? seeing thou art not sick. This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. He's depressed. He sees Nehemiah is depressed. Then I was very sore afraid. Nehemiah talking. Why? Because if you displease the king, you could get killed. Up with his head. Take, throw him off the nearest cliff. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, sepulchres, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? He's telling him why he's upset. The place of his father's, the holy city, is in ruins. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? And this next phrase is being said parenthetically can't blame him. So I prayed to the God of heaven because the king said, what do you want? I prayed to the God of heaven and I said unto the king if it please the king and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight that thou wouldest send me. Circle that. Send me. He's not saying have something done about this. You know, somebody should accept you. Know, somebody's accountable. No, send me, send me unto Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And here's God entering in. I'll show you how God entered in. He already entered in. And the king said unto, unto me, parenthetically it says, the queen also sitting by him. Now, we always pass over that, and I don't think I've ever told you this before. But the queen that's sitting next to the king happens to be none other, and most sources agree, than Esther. The one that said, if I perish, I perish. Esther, that's the queen. She understands what's going on with God's people and the Jews in this particular sense. She's one of them. The king said under the the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I sent him a time. This Nehemiah talking and go over. Again, he says, Moreover, seventh verse, I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me, to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come under Judah. He doesn't want to run to a bunch of Nazis out there saying, Papers, please, your papers. He's, the king's going to give him papers to go through all the other lands while he's trying to get to Jerusalem. Give me some letters. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forces, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace. So he's one letters of, to let him through and a letter unto his head carpenter, his head lumberjack, so he could have timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. God's entering in. He's recognizing God at work here. Then I came to the governors beyond the river. He went to do this thing. Rebuild the gates of Jerusalem or the walls of Jerusalem. He gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So he got everything he needs. And when he gets there, 10th verse, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, 
it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I was understating and underestimating when I said naysayers. This is more than naysayers, but they are naysaying. It grieved them exceedingly there was a come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. They don't want them to do that. They don't want them to rebuild the walls. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. What's the number three stand for? That's right, divine manifestation. Don't pass over numbers. and That's another way that God talks to us. Came to Jerusalem, I was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Remember Gideon? He was afraid to do what God wanted him to do. So he went at night with his cohorts and did it but he did it. This one's a little bit different, but he went in the nighttime because he didn't want anybody to know what was going on. Thirteenth verse, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port. I think we know what that might be. And viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Now he's going to assess it. I went on to the gate of the fountain, to the king's pool. There was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. It was full of rubble, all broken down. He couldn't even get through there. Then went I up in the night, in case you didn't hear him the first time, at night by the brook and viewed the wall, turned back and entered the gate of the valley, and so returned. He's going around all over assessing what needs to be done. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor the priests, nor the nobles, nor to the rulers, not anybody. Didn't tell anybody. It's a secret. It's a stealth patrol he's on here. But then I said unto them after he came back, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may be no more a reproach. Reproach means disgrace. So we're not going to be a disgrace anymore. It really should be saying, rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, because it had already been built before. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. Let them know what God had done. Gave them the letters, saw his way through, did what he needed to do to get the job done which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Let's do it. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, now they're adding another naysayer here, the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What's this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Then I answered them, Nehemiah talking, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Faith statement. He was just going there to do the, do the work. And they're saying, how are you going to do that? And he's answering them, in faith. That's a faith statement. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. He's telling them, butt out. It's none of your business. And they go to the septuagint task of rebuilding. Then Eliashib, Eliashib, by the way, is the name of the high priest, but by the way, it means God will restore. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests. Now, mind you, they're just starting this. And they builded the sheep gate. 
they sanctified it and set up the doors of it even unto the tower of Mea. But I'm going to point out something to you. The sheep gate is the place where they bring the sacrifice, the place where they brought the sacrifice. I want you to note that God always starts a work with sacrifice, with giving. They're going to start this work. First thing they do is build a place where the giving is done and set up the doors of it even up to the Tower of Mea. Mea means 100. What's the number 10 mean? Human responsibility. There's something that we have to do. There's something that they had to do. Because 10 times 10, this is human responsibility multiplied. They have to build this for God. Sanctify it to the Tower of Hananiel, which means grace. And then it's going to go into a catalog here, which we're not going to go into tonight, but I'll give you some examples. Because they all set up by orders and by family and all the different parts of the wall, what they were going to do. Next to him builded the men of Jericho. Next to them builded Zachar, the son of Imri. And it tells you but the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build. It tells you each gate, each part of the wall, each family names them. They're all being cataloged for posterity, mind you. And it goes on and on and on, paragraph after paragraph. Who repaired what? And it's commoners and it's nobles. And it goes on for page after page, cataloging all this that was done. All the different families, what they built fountains, they built gates, they got everything that was done or were working on everything that needed to be done on the wall around Jerusalem until you get to the beginning of the fourth chapter. It takes us a long time to catalog all, all that and it gets a little confusing, a little bewildering, but it's all listed there and you can certainly go to it yourself and look at that. Chapter 4. But, what do you think is coming? But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. These are enemies. Satan rising up to oppose what God rose up to do. I'm calling them naysayers as sort of a lighthearted way of saying it, but they are. They're saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Who, you know, where do you get off doing that? It came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we builded the wall, he was <laughs> wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria, and he said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? That was Sambalat. Third verse. Now Tobiah, the other one. Tobiah the Ammon, Ammonite was by him and he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. It won't hold up, is what they're saying. You, you go ahead and try it. It's not going to work. You ever heard that before? Then Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Cover not their iniquity. It's getting tough. And let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. He let it stop them. Sixth verse. So we... So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. They got it halfway done, for the people had a mind to work. But, notice these are all buts when there's evidence. But, it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, when you ever hear a lot of these ites, they're generally speaking enemies of God heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and 
that the breaches began to be stopped, they were not only wroth, they were very wroth, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem. If we can't talk you out of it, we're going to stop you from doing it. Conspired all of them to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. So they're getting ready to respond to the threat and properly. 11th verse. Go back to the 10th verse. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish. So we're not able to build the wall. Starting, some of them are starting to get doubtful. 11th verse. And our adversary said, they're saying of Nehemiah and his folks, they, Nehemiah and his folks, shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. They're planning a sneak attack in there. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return to us, they'll be upon you. They're all over the place, waiting to ambush them. What's the response? They lay down their tools. Did they run and hide? Did they call 911? Therefore said I, in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families. Family after family, together, with their swords, their spears, and their bones, their bows, all involved. And I looked and rose up and said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. They're fighting for nothing less than that. Nothing more important than that. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work. So they got ready. They got ready like the Scots did. And when they found out that they found out, they went back to work. But, and this is a good but, it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known to us and God had brought their counsel to naught, we returned all of us to the wall, everyone to his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants wrought the work. Listen to what they're saying. And the other half of them held both the spears and shields and bows and the habergians. So they, half of them were working, half of them were on guard. Serious business. Life and death. The thing that we're trying to do here in getting God's true word out is eternal life and death. And the rulers were behind all the houses of Judah. They which builded on the wall and they that bear the burdens with those that laid it, everyone with his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. Listen to what they're saying. Half of them were working. Half of them were on guard with their weapons. And even the half that were working had a, a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other hand. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side. And so he builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles and the rulers and the rest of the people, 
The work is great and large. We are separated on the wall, one far from another. There's not enough of them to cover the whole wall of the city. In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither. They're talking about a react, reaction party here. You hear the whole trumpet blow over there, you go over there and help them. You hear it blow over there, you go over there and help them. That's what he's setting up here. Resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. Another faith statement in the middle of all this. God's going to make it possible. God's going to fight for us. But remember the human responsibility here. They're ready to do the work and fight for it and protect themselves. And so we labored in the work. 21st verse. Half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning until the stars appeared. All day long into the evening. Likewise, at the same time, I said to the people, let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be guard to us and labor on the day. So they're doing this all together. Reminds me of uh, Second World War, a pale shadow, but when they had Meatless Tuesday and things like that, they were all together. doing their part in the fight. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes. They never even got undressed, stayed dressed the whole time, saving that every one of them put off for washing. I repeat, they were ready. It goes on, and they continue to be resisted by the Sambalats and the Tobias. And the Arabians. Tooth and nail. Every bit of the way. And they are completely ready. They've set a guard. They're armed. They're doing the work. And they yet completed what God wanted them to do. I want you to go to chapter 6 here. Because these naysayers, Satan rising up to oppose, doesn't give up. They don't give up. Just like in the New Testament where it says, when Satan and Jesus are debating, and it says that, the, that Satan departed for a season. That doesn't mean he went away and left Jesus alone. It's a terminology of what a boxer does when they're in a prize fight and they have a little exchange and then, the, then they back up looking for another opening. That's what they mean. Satan backed up looking for another opening. These Sanballat and Tobias, same thing. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah, 6th chapter, 1st verse, and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Though at that time I had not set up the doors on the gates, so the wall's done, gates are not on yet. Now they're going to change tactics. Sambalot and Geshem sent a, sent a message to Nehemiah saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. It says, But they thought to do me mischief. Now they're trying to trick him. So well, let's, let's talk it over. Let's have some peace talks here. But they were just trying to get him alone. When I sent messages unto them, third verse, I'm doing a great work. I'm sorry, I'm busy, booked up. I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? And they do this over and over again. They do it four times. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Sorry, busy. Then sent Sambalot his servant unto me in a like manner the fifth time with an open letter that's like a news like a newspaper wherein was written it's reported among the heathen and Gashmu saith that thou and the Jews think to rebel for which cause thou buildest the wall that thou mayest be their king according to these words and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem saying there's a king in Judah talking about Nehemiah 
And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Let us take counsel together. What does Nehemiah say? You're a liar. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. And they change tactics and come at him again. In the tenth verse, it says, Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehatbiel, who was shut up, and he said, Let's meet together in the house of God. That's a safe place, right? Let's meet together in the house of God. Within the temple, let us shut the doors of the temple. For they will come to slay thee in the night. They'll come to slay thee. So they're going to get you. So come come to the temple. Was Nehemiah saying, I told you it was tough. Listen. And I said, should such a man as I flee? Who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, Nehemiah talking, I perceive that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Never ending, it goes on and on and on. There is an ending to this that we're not going to get to tonight, because I want to just tell you now, they completed the wall and the gates. In the 15th verse, it says, So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elul in 50 and 2 days. They did the whole work in 52 days by not giving up, by trusting God, by acting in faith, by keeping their dukes up and staying on guard, not by telling Sanballat and Tobiah, God loves you. They were tough, and they stood up and did the right thing under those circumstances and got the job done. So I'm saying to you, keep your dukes up. Be ready in the building of God's church and ministry. Tool in one hand, weapon in the other hand. Don't listen to or let the Sanballats and Tobias of the world discourage or dissuade. And don't listen to or let the Sanballats and Tobias within us discourage and dissuade or destroy. We made it through 2013 and beyond in Jesus' name. And that's my message tonight. And it's offering time. The address should be up on the screen. That's part of your participation. We don't raise money for need or for projects. You give for the teaching. And if you've been taught, you share materially with the one that taught you. That's what it says in the book of Galatians. And for the offertory, we're going to have. That's a good one. A good one to close with. I will join you on that. Is that it? <laughs> he walks every step of Calvary's rugged way. He is life completely. Bring a better day. Jesus.
places there. God really does love you. You that act in faith, trusting Him. So I'm determined for us to all be like Nehemiah and his crowd to get this job done for God, to get the word out to those that are His. Nothing more and nothing, nothing less than that. So tune in next week for more teaching. Get your messages to me. It's important. And uh, we're going to close with our theme song. Keep on walking in faith because that's the only way you're going to make it. Well, I searched and I searched for a road that led to glory. I want to Keep on walking